there has taken place <clears throat> in the Catholic Church a revolution. This is something that, although it, it is often, uh, there are attempts to deny it, yet it is really objectively and critically considered something undeniable that a revolution has taken place in the church. If we dispassionately and calmly and without prejudice examine the evidence, there is no other possible conclusion except that indeed there has been a revolution in the church, a revolution that began just over 50 years ago. We must examine critically the facts, the established factual evidence, the documents, analyze and consider them. Because there is one very fatal tendency of the human mind when it comes to dealing with religion, with one's faith, with one's belief system, with one's faith. And that is, no matter how great is our learning, no matter how high is our level of intelligence, no matter how well prepared we are and disciplined in, in scientific methods of, of analysis and thought, in matters of religion, there is a tendency simply to switch off that critical apparatus and to and to to rush to snap judgments that are really unreasoned, that are not the fruit of analysis, but of a knee-jerk reaction, of a sudden reflexive conclusion that is not soundly based logically in firmly established premises. The premises may be correct, but all too often the conclusion does not follow from the premise. So I first make this reminder because in the past, talking on this subject, <clears throat> Sometimes people have concluded that perhaps, or more than just perhaps, that what I'm saying is contrary to the teaching of the church, and of course it is absolutely, in what I'm saying is totally in line with the teaching of the church. Or that I have rebelled against uh, the church's magisterium, which is of course utter nonsense. I remember one time, after one talk I had given, uh, there were some clergy who, who got up and, and headed for the door and went out. And there was a bishop there who remonstrated with those uh, clergymen, uh, saying, well, listen to what Father Paul is saying at least, because what he is saying is in fact the teaching of the magisterium of the church. That is, in fact, how this first book that I, my first book that I wrote, came into being. The Suicide of Altering the Faith in the Liturgy. Because I would speak about the revolution that has taken place in the church. And people would say, well, you're, you're, a, you're a radical. You're, you're against the Pope. And I therefore 
produced hundreds of notes of documentation from the church's magisterial documents to show that what I am saying is not my opinion. It is based entirely and follows logically and necessarily from the documents of the magisterium. And if we want to, under, if we want to understand the gravity of the revolution that has taken place in the church since the Second Vatican Council, we have to consider, we have to analyze, and through that thought process arrive at a conclusion and not simply jump to conclusions that do not relate logically to the premises which are rooted in Catholic dogma, but which are non-applicable to the subject matter that I present, which is soundly rooted in Catholic teaching. That being said, that there has been a revolution in the church, let us recall Cardinal Leo Sunins, one of the major uh, 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 personages in the, uh, in, the, in the Second Vatican Council, at the time of the Second Vatican Council. He declared in one discourse of his that in the, in the Second Vatican Council that the church, that this, that this uh, what, what has taken place in the church is the French Revolution in the church. Now, that statement is far more loaded than it might appear. Father Yves Congar, later made a cardinal, uh, made an equally blunt statement when he said, uh, in the Second Vatican Council, the church has undergone its own, has undergone quietly its own October revolution. Now, what was the force that brought about, that brought into being, that drove the French Revolution? That force, of course, is the sect of, was the sect and remains the sect of Freemasonry. What inspired the, the French Revolution was Freemasonry. Likewise, the October Revolution that brought into being the Soviet Union. That was also the work of Freemasonry. Lenin and Trotsky were Masons of the 33rd degree. And uh, very interestingly, it is pointed out in, uh, by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his uh, work, October 1914. Although the book is written in the form of a novel, there is much historical content there. There is far more fact than fiction in the book. The story is a, a way of presenting to you the historical background and to bring it to life. And that is the way Solzhenitsyn wrote. And those revolutionaries who were at the forefront of the Soviet Revolution to transform society from the old order into the new world of communism, very openly proclaimed that their work, that their revolution was simply a continuation of the French Revolution. The idea that it is a, another stage of the self-same global revolution. And again, the revolution of Freemasonry is global in its intent, global in its scope. Its purpose is to bring about a new world order and a new religion. A religion that is not based on supernatural principles, nor belief in a transcendent God. As Father Dennis Fahi explained again and again in his lectures, 
as a seminary professor. Freemasonry is implacably opposed to the transcendent God. The religion of Freemasonry is professed to be the ancient mysteries, meaning the pagan dualism, pantheism, and uh, what is superficially also polytheistic. So while you may have a whole uh, multitude of deities, gods and goddesses in the ancient pagan religions, yet you had two principles, the principle of good and evil, which exist according to their way of thinking in equilibrium. And it is these two principles that are bringing everything into being in this world and the source of all motion and change. It is, in a simple word, immanentism. It is, the, it is what Spinoza called Deus sive natura, the God of nature, that God and nature are one and the self same thing. There is no distinction between creation and creature. To create creation and creator. All is one. This is the religious doctrine behind the revolutions that have been ongoing for centuries. And Cardinal Sunans referred to the revolution, the French Revolution in the Church, ushered in at the time of the Second Vatican Council. And Yves Congar, later Cardinal Congar, referred to, the, referred to that period as the Church's October Revolution. How could such a revolution take place? If we look back to the Protestant Reformation, the principal instrument of change to bring about the revolution in the minds and in the souls of men was the liturgy. I recall back in 1983, I was visiting a Franciscan friend of mine, a certain Father Antonio, and he had uh, a big stack of copies of a magazine called Chiesa Viva. And he opened up one of the back issues and he says, Father Paul, listen to this. And he starts reading from the magazine. He's reading the published Masonic documents written in the 1920s, outlining precisely what kind of changes they would like to have made in the Catholic liturgy to bring the liturgy in line with Masonic doctrine. It has to be done subtly, of course, because if the, if the changes were introduced by Masonic infiltrators were to be something very open and blunt, well, the Catholic people and the Catholic hierarchy would unanimously turn away from it and not be, allow themselves to be taken in. So it has to be done with subtlety so that the poison can be swallowed unnoticed. The inspiration to make these changes in the Catholic liturgy did not originate in the 1920s at the time those documents were formulated. We go back to the days of Pope Pius VI, who in his apostolic constitution, Auctorum Fide, very forcefully condemned the idea 
of making radical alterations in the Catholic liturgy. So the pseudo council of Pistoia proposed a liturgical reform that would bring about a Masonic inspired revolution along the lines of the principles of Freemasonry, exactly as formulated uh, uh, to bring this about in those documents that were published, that were written in the 1920s and published in Chiesa Viva. Pius VI declared that recalling the liturgy to, to greater simplicity of rites by expressing it in the vernacular language or by uttering it in a loud voice as if the present order of the liturgy received and approved by the church had emanated in some part from the forgetfulness of the principles by which it should be regulated as rash, offensive to pious ears, insulting to the church, favorable to the charges of heretics. The key word here, because it's a, this is a principle of Catholic dogma as it applies to Catholic liturgy. The idea that these kind of changes in their very essence, are opposed to the liturgy received and approved by the church. We see in the Tridentine Profession of Faith, we see it again in the Profession of Faith of the First Vatican Council, we see it in Session 7, Canon 13, on the sacraments in general, the solemn anathema of the Council of Trent, infallibly upholding, infallibly upholding the teaching which has been repeated again and again by the popes down through the centuries and by councils down through the centuries that there must not be adulteration of the liturgy that the, 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 the liturgy, which is the received and approved rites used in the solemn administration of the sacraments, must be preserved and they must not be contaminated or distorted in any way. They must, the substance of the liturgy must be safeguarded and preserved. This is in the profession of faith. That's the reason why, for example, in the Council of Florence, it is insisted in the Decretum Progressis that the sacrament of the Eucharist is to be confected according to the custom of each ritual church, whether it be the Roman church or whether it be the Greek church. And therefore, this very solemn definition of the Council of Florence is that in the Greek church, they must adhere to the Greek tradition using leavened bread. And in the Roman tradition, what must be used is the unleavened bread because this is essential to the received and approved customary rights, that the law of custom has that binding of a force. So while Jesus Christ and the apostles uh, did not uh, use the Roman Missal as we know it today, nor did they use the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, Yet the principles formulated dogmatically in the church, in the apostolic period, our, our Lord Jesus Christ pronounced the dogmatic value of the law of tradition. And St. Paul, speaking 
professedly on the topic of liturgy. When he says, what I have received, I have handed on. And he says, hold fast to the traditions. And this is the reason why the church down through the ages has taught infallibly and insisted on the safeguarding, the preservation of the liturgy and adherence to the received and approved rites customarily used in the church. It is the tradition, the handing down, which is the very substance of tradition, which establishes the custom. And the custom has the force of law sanctioned by God himself. And that is why the profession of faith itself demands of the Catholic conscience adherence to the traditional rites, the customary received in the proved rites of the church. And so Pope Pius V, when he issued his missal, he pointed out in that document, the promulgation, quo primum tempore, that this is the right that has been handed down in the Roman church. The Second Vatican Council announced that there should be a, re a revision in the liturgy, but carefully pointed out that these principles are to be upheld. The substance of the rite is to be preserved. But the fatal flaw in so many of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, we're not dealing with statements that are ambiguous. The statements are quite clear. The ambiguity stems from the, the contradictions between conflicting statements that are really not reconcilable. Because on the one hand, the Second Vatican Council demands in its Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution and the Liturgy, unswerving adherence to tradition and to the preservation of the rites. On the other hand, it announces those principles condemned, those principles brought forth by the false council of Pistoia and condemned solemnly by Pope Pius VI in Octorum Fide. This is the kind of ambiguity that caused so much great confusion because <clears throat> the principles being set forth are utterly and logically incompatible. We have that which has been taught century after century down through the ages by the church and upheld in the council document. And at the same time, we have being set forth what the church in its magisterial pronouncements in previous centuries has unequivocally condemned. <coughs> With this kind of confusion, one can understand how the council fathers themselves did not always understand exactly the, the, the full extent uh, of, of what was being proposed by, uh, by the framers of the documents. And they were not given sufficient time to read the documents. They complained at the time that they did not have time to carefully examine the documents and they were pressured to put their signature on the documents being told the Holy Father is going to sign the documents. You must also. So what took place at the Second Vatican Council set the stage for the liturgical revolution <coughs> that took place after the Second Vatican Council when Pope Paul VI established that commission, the Concilium 
uh, for uh, executing the uh, uh, the apostolic constitution and the liturgy to to bring into being the revision of the liturgy, which bears an uncanny resemblance to the 1549 liturgy of Thomas Cranmer, the Protestant reformer. If you've read the, the three volumes of Father Johannes Dürrmann <clears throat> on the theology of Pope John Paul II, you will notice that he goes far beyond just the analysis of the mind of Cardinal Karol Wojtyla and then of Pope John Paul II, of his thought. It's a very critical, I mean in a scientific sense, a critical uh, myth, methodical analysis. <clears throat> and going beyond the thought of Pope John Paul II even penetrates uh, into the subject matter that we're dealing with here, the liturgical change. And the changes in the liturgy uh, unquestionably and undeniably are founded upon the principle of making the liturgy, bringing it in line with the ecumenism that was proclaimed in the document of the Council Unitatis Redintegratio. <clears throat> if there had not been the liturgical reform it would have been impossible to bring about what Father Richard McByan calls the Reformed Church. Because there would be, and there remain, if one looks carefully at the traditional liturgy, and one looks carefully at what is being proclaimed in the name of ecumenism, there are glaring contradictions. So there was the need <clears throat> to draw up a liturgy that would be entirely in line with the principles of ecumenism. And this is the animating principle which brought into being the liturgical reform which went beyond revision or reform and has become a revolution in the church. As Congar, Yves Congar himself referred to it, the October Revolution in the church, a true revolution. The Second Vatican Council vigorously promoted this notion of ecumenism, but did not define it. And many of the council fathers <clears throat> made their complaints that these terms are being used, but they can be understood differently. So what does the council mean? Unfortunately, after the council, many documents came out, documents that were not uh, bearing the theological note of infallibility, in which it was proclaimed that the church has an irrevocable commitment to ecumenism, and this ecumenism is the ecumenism that began in that movement in the 1920s among the churches of the reform.
I'm quoting a non-infallible document, Ut Unum Sint, an encyclical letter of Pope John Paul II. And the reason why I, I mention this is because that position is utterly and diametrically opposed to a forceful pronouncement made by Pope Pius XI, who unequivocally stated that that brand of ecumenism will destroy the church to its very foundations. Were God to allow it, it would bring the church to total ruin. And so, when Sister Lucia of Fatima, in one of her letters, spoke of a, a diabolical disorientation in the church that would reach up to the highest levels, <clears throat> we can see the confusion that the ambiguities and contradictions have led to. Because there is no doubt that Pope John Paul II, in his heart, desired the good of the church and promoted to the best of his knowledge and his ability to bring about the good of the church. Yet due to the confusion where we have the discrepancies, the contradictions, and the ambiguities that are so difficult to resolve, in the various council documents, and sometimes within the same council document, it caused such confusion that even in the highest levels of the hierarchy of the church, there is opposition. And so that in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and even today, there remains opposition. Bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal. For a number of decades, the flawed liturgy of Pope Paul VI, one which was described by Cardinal Josef Ratzinger in the preface to the second German edition of a book uh, called uh, The Reform of the Roman Liturgy, I believe, by uh, Monsignor Klaus uh, I, Gamber, by Monsignor Klaus Gamber. Cardinal Ratzinger stated very bluntly that the liturgy of Pope Paul VI was a banal, on the spot fabrication. Strong language, strong words. So it is no mystery that in one of his talks, Cardinal Ratzinger stated that there was a need to revise the new liturgy of Paul VI to bring it into conformity with the Catholic faith because there are aspects of that liturgy in its symbolism and in some of its words that are so strongly, strongly uh, suggestive of Protestant teaching that the Missal of Paul VI is even used in Protestant churches because the Protestants can very easily interpret the meaning of the, of, 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 of the liturgical prayers in symbolism in terms of, of Protestant doctrine. In Walsingham, England, in the Protestant church, Catholic people have gone in to visit and see the liturgy taking place, and they are uh, quite taken aback by the fact that what they see taking place seems to be word for word, and every gesture uh, Everything in that liturgy is identical to the Missal of Paul VI. And of course, the Anglican Protestants explain that, well, they are using the Missal of Paul VI. <coughs> Cardinal 
Father Novacek has said the liturgy needs to be revised in order to be brought into conformity with the Catholic faith. He stated quite bluntly and in print that the liturgy of Paul VI was, a, was an on-the-spot fabrication. This violates every principle of what lawfully, according to Catholic teaching, brings into being a truly faithful Catholic liturgy that can be called the received and approved rite. I've explained this in my book, The Suicide of Authoring the Faith in the Liturgy. Other works go more deeply into it, but I believe I have gotten to the very heart of the matter with what is wrong with the Missal of Pope Paul VI. I can say this much. <clears throat> we can be very thankful, and I in particular am eternally grateful to our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, for having issued his motu proprio, Sumorum Pontificum, five years ago. Because although it does not remedy that revolution that has been taking place in the church, the modernist revolution which is being fought from parish to parish and diocese to diocese, which has brought about what has been taking shape for many years, already during the reign of Pope John Paul II and what is, taking, what is intensifying in our own time is a revolt <clears throat> in the church and in the hierarchy against the Pope himself. <coughs> so while it may appear to be, and it may eventually be the judgment of history, that the changes that have been made by Pope Benedict will be considered to be too little and too late. Nevertheless, I, I myself am eternally grateful to the Holy Father for, for doing what he's been able to do in spite of tremendous pressures. Because before the issuance of Sumorum Pontificum, priests who celebrated that liturgy which is unquestionably the customary traditional rite of the church, the received and approved rite which is so <clears throat> required by the profession of faith, those priests were branded as being unfaithful to the Holy Father, as being disobedient, as being rebels. I recall in the year 2003 when I traveled to Russia and I <clears throat> was with a group of modernist leading charismatic liberal leaning Catholics. I had made the agreement with them that I would I would, uh, I would accompany them on their trip as their spiritual director and chaplain, but the condition was that I must celebrate only, I will celebrate only the traditional rite of mass according to the Missal of Pope Pius V, and that in matters of spiritual direction, I will be entirely in charge because I cannot modify my teaching according to the likings of those who are more or less liberal or more or less conservative. I take seriously the Athanasian Creed, which requires that we profess the Catholic faith integral and inviolate. And that Catholic faith, the profession of faith, as I mentioned before, requires adherence to the received and approved rights handed down in the church. That being done, some of the more charismatic members of the congregation, of the, of the group, complained 
They wanted me to celebrate the Mass for them in English according to the Missal of Pope Paul VI. And I refused. So I went, I w went to the Cathedral of the Assumption in St. Petersburg and celebrated the Mass the, the, according to the traditional Roman rite. And when I preached my homily, the subject of the homily was the necessity to observe tradition. <clears throat> you can understand the words of St. Bernadette Subaru when she said the only thing she fears is bad Catholics. Those liberal, charismatic types were enraged. They were so enraged that they made my ticket to Warsaw disappear and left me stranded in Russia. <laughs> but those Russian Orthodox people who heard my sermon they were of a different mind. They concurred entirely with what I said about the need to conform to tradition and to adhere to the liturgy of the church, received and approved. This is what this revolution in the church has done. That the Orthodox who are not in communion with the Church of Rome, by and large among the faithful, they have a better understanding of these doctrines than most Catholics. And it was one of those Russians who made a superhuman effort to, to secure for me uh, the, the, uh, the booking for a flight and uh, I was able to safely get to Berlin and uh, back into the, the, into the Western world where I could move about more freely and made my way back to Canada where I was living at that time. Ecumenism, Saint Maximilian Kolbe declared, is the enemy of the Immaculata. Again, this is a much more loaded statement than what we might first grasp at the surface level. <clears throat> the Immaculata, the mother of God. It is she who is proclaimed by the ancient fathers of the church to be the very prototype of the church. She was the very embodiment of the church. She was the very first Catholic, the very first Christian. Jesus was the founder of the church. And his holy mother worshiped him as her Lord and God, incarnate in her immaculate womb. She is the woman of Genesis who will crush the head of the serpent. Ecumenism is her enemy, which is to say the enemy of Jesus Christ, the enemy of God. Ecumenism is the doctrine of Freemasonry. As I point out in my book, The Suicide of Altering the Faith in the Liturgy, it has no basis in scripture. It has no basis in tradition. Look in the Old Testament, how the prophets thundered against all other religions. There's only the one religion of the one true God. And the apostles 
receiving the teaching from Christ and from the tradition of the Jewish scriptures, taught the self-same doctrine. There can be no communion with any other religion because unity consists in one thing, those bonds of communion. Faith, the one faith, the Catholic faith, the revealed dogmas, the sacred doctrine, the sacraments which confer grace instituted by Jesus Christ, and ecclesiastical governance, the legitimate legislative and governing authority of the Pope and the bishops through their apostolic succession through which they receive their authority from Jesus Christ. And this is absent in the Protestant religions. And it is especially absent in the non-Christian religions. There is no basis for any kind of unity with other religions. It cannot be. It is utterly opposed to the Catholic faith. And that is why I have, I have not flinched to state in my book that ecumenism is ultimately a heresy. It was solemnly condemned by Pope Pius XI by a canonized saint, Maximilian Kolbe, who declared that it is the very enemy of the mother of God, the mother of the church. And when ecumenism is promoted as if there could be any kind of unity with the, with the pagan religions, with the, with the non-Christian religions, to say nothing of the Protestant religions, who are the most offended by this? We, we, we strive so much to restore unity with the Eastern Orthodox churches, and yet it is precisely the hierarchy and the faithful of those Eastern Orthodox churches who are the most disgusted with the Protestantization of the Roman Church, the corruption of the faith that has taken place in the Roman Church, the doctrinal changes which are true alteration of dogma, alteration of the faith, which started and were promoted in the reforms of the liturgy, exactly as were instituted by the Protestant Reformation to bring about the revolution of religion through alteration of the liturgy. I spoke with one Russian who said, yes, we, we could return to unity with the Roman church. We made it very clear, they can have no part with all of the nonsense, all of the Protestantization all the banalization in the liturgy, the confusion in doctrine, that they must be able to practice inviolate their sacred traditions, which date back to the time before the break between Rome and Constantinople. This is why I ex explain further. In the mystery of iniquity, <clears throat> that the only way to bring about unity in the church is obedience to Christ's command. Go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 
And the instrument that will bring this about will be the consecration of Russia requested by Our Lady of Fatima. Our Lady has promised that this, that this consecration will bring about what she calls the conversion of Russia. We don't have to overanalyze exactly what that means. We accept what Our Lady says in faith. It's not an assent of divine and Catholic faith. It's not a dogma. But there is a moral obligation that when heaven speaks, the children of men must listen. We are the creatures of God. The creature must obey the creator. We may be born of women and sons of men, but through our baptism, we are made children of God. And when God speaks to his children, they have the moral obligation to listen, even if the revelation is not a dogma of faith and is not an article of faith. Our Lady of Fatima said, speaking of herself in the third person, only she can help you. <clears throat> what we do know that the conversion of Russia will bring about is perfect communion, perfect unity between the Eastern churches and the Roman church. <coughs> and the spirit of the Orthodox Church, their reverence and adherence to tradition is something that is sorely needed in the Western Roman Church because that is, is what has been most corrupted in the Western Church. And that is what has been most preserved in the Eastern Orthodox churches. That true ecumenical uni unity that brings us together in the one household of God will not be brought about by negotiations or diplomacy. That revolution which would destroy our faith and bring us into the Masonic one world religion foretold by no less than Pope St. Pius X in Notre Charge Apostolique. The one means that will bring about peace in the world and the salvation of souls and unity between the Eastern and Western churches and ultimately the con conversion of the Protestants, the Muslims, and even the Jews, that will be the consecration of Russia that Our Lady of Fatima requested. There will no longer be any need for an ecumenical movement because the true ecumenical unity will be attained. The path that we are on now leads to destruction. Cardinal Ratzinger himself admitted that he did not know where this ecumenical movement that is being promoted in the church is leading. When he said, the end of all ecumenical effort is to attain the true unity of the church. I just explained very clearly what that is and I've explained it in both of my books. The faith, the sacraments, ecclesiastical governance under the headship of the Roman pontiff. That alone is the true unity of the church. For the moment, I wouldn't dare venture to suggest any concrete realization possible or imaginable of this future church. We are at an intermediate stage of unity and diversity. Again, we are dealing here with a theological disorientation. There is only one unity possible. Of course, this future church that Cardinal Ratzinger is musing about here is something that is logically impossible in terms of a Catholic 
context. Because the Catholic Church can only exist with unswerving adherence to the faith, integral and undefiled, to the sacraments, to the sound of the ministration of the sacraments and the celebration of the sacred liturgy according to the dogmatically pronounced norms of adherence to the received and approved right. <coughs> this alone is unity. Any other kind of unity is inconceivable. And so it is no surprise when Cardinal Rossiger says that this future church is something that is not imaginable. The ecumenical unity of that ecumenical movement condemned so forcefully by Pope Pius XI is some, the ecumenical unity is summed up and clearly seen by Pope St. Pius X when he said a great movement of apostasy is being organized in every country for the establishment of a one world church which shall have neither dogmas nor hierarchy nor discipline for the mind, nor curb for the passions, in which under the pretext of freedom and human dignity would bring back to the world the reign of legalized cunning and force the oppression of the weak and of those who toil and suffer. He went on to say that this would be a unity that is neither Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. It was inspired and conceived of and brought into the world by Freemasonry. And that is the only kind of unity that can result from it and from the defective liturgy that was ushered into the church after the Second Vatican Council by Pope Paul VI, and which, thanks be to God, our Holy Father, is in the process of attempting to remedy, and may God grant him the grace to remedy it further and bring about a restoration of the received and approved rights in the church. <clears throat>